Well, listen, I'm doing something a little bit different uh, lately, and you don't have to feel like you have to do it. But uh, if you would, I'm going to read from the word of the Lord. I'm going to be in Psalm chapter 2. I'll be in the ESV version as we read. If you can stand up with me as I read. Let me, before you even, thank you, sister. But you can go ahead and stand up for the reading of the word if you choose to. Uh, you don't, I'm not expecting everybody to do it. And, and the reason that I'm doing this is because I want to really reverence the Lord. Amen. I want to start as a culture for myself to reverence the presence of the yes. Lord, to reverence Hallelujah. worship, to reverence his word. And so I appreciate you for standing with me as we read Psalm chapter 2 in the ESV version. Start in verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bounds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. And you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Father, I pray this morning, Lord, that you would be with me and that you would use me as a vessel, Lord, to speak forth your truth, to speak your word, oh Lord God, that your word is already anointed, but I need you to anoint me, Lord God, this mouth. Lord God, that as your word goes forth, it would have an effect in the people's lives, oh Lord God, in the hearts of your people, oh Lord God, we just give you glory and honor in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing with me, praise God. So the title of my message this morning is, What a Father, exclamation point, what a son, exclamation point. I have to tell you that the message itself has changed because What's in, in, as I've gone through, and you know, that's one of the things that there's a process of, of, of coming to the end of what the Lord has for his people, and the whole time he's speaking and oftentimes changing. But over the last couple of weeks, the Lord's really been ministering to me about the Father's love, amen, about the Father's love and, uh, and, and really intimacy with the Father. And you know, we're not going to try to come up with a working definition for love, but I can tell you that the working definition for love in the way that the world is changing before us may not be the biblical definition. Yes, I'm just going to leave it like that. As a matter of fact, I'm telling you it's not. It's not the biblical definition of love. And, and, and in reality, we're not going to take the time to get through it right now. But in order to really understand the love of God, you're going to have to have a, a, a somewhat of an understanding of the word of God. Because that's how God reveals himself is through his word. Amen. And so it started off really where the Lord was speaking to me about intimacy. And I was very grateful in my prayer time of realizing what Jesus had done for me and how he had opened up the way. He had opened up the path to where I could enter in and, and, be, and have intimacy with my father and to understand him uh, in a way like I could not have without Jesus. Amen. But like he always does, he always brings me back to his heart. And maybe the way he shows me his heart might be a little bit different than the way he shows you his heart. But, but this is how God shows me his heart. He, he, he's, he's constantly reminding me, son, I know about the concerns of my people. And I've shared this with you many times. I know, but, but let me just say it again. I know about the concerns of my people. I hear their cry. And he even said it in Matthew. He said, you have, I know the needs that you have. But you ought to not be concerned about the things that the Gentiles are concerned about. You ought to not be concerned about your cares, your worldly cares and your needs, because I already know you have those needs. Those are the things that the Gentiles 
are concerned about. The nations that don't know me are concerned that they're not going to be taken care of, that they're not going to have clothing to wear, that they're not going to have food on their table. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added unto you. And I don't know if we always know what it means to seek the kingdom of God, but I do want to say this. God has a plan and it's in his word. Amen. And I believe that that he wants to unfold some of that this morning. This may be part one. But I want to go back to the psalm a little bit. And we're not going to go to each verse. But I just want to say when it says, why do the nations rage? Why do the nations rage? And why do the peoples imagine a vain thing? And in the King James Version of the Bible, it says, why do, they, why do the heathen rage? And then the reason why is because it's talking about nations. You see, God's got, your, God's got a big old plan. And not only is he wanting to work in your life and in your family's life and in your personal situations, he's got something going on over the face of the earth that he is dealing with. And I'm here to tell you that what he's dealing with on the big scope of the world also affects your personal life. Then what God wants is people that are going to partner with him and yield to his will and work with him. Amen. He's giving you the opportunity. He's giving me the opportunity to engage with him in what he's doing on this earth. Amen. But, but the nations are raging against them. The kings, it says the kings of the earth, they set themselves. And the idea is like they're ready for war. They're getting in a fighting position in a stance where they're ready to. And they said, let us cast him away from us. Let us burst his bands asunder. You know what this is descriptive? Well, this is descriptive of rebellion. The spirit of rebellion that would rebel against God. Rebel against the word of God. That would say, no, we don't want you to speak into our life. We don't want to hear what you have to say, God. Instead, we'll shake our fist in your face and we'll say, we're going to live the way we want to live and do what we want to do. And, 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 and they're coming against Yahweh. That's the word Lord there and his anointed Messiah. They're, they're doing this against Yahweh and his Messiah. And in the next verses, it says in verse 6. First, he says that the, the God of heaven, he, sit, he sits above them and he laughs at them. Yes, yes. At their plans and, their, and whatever they think that they're conspiring against him. But this is what he says. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Yeah. Yeah. This is 1000 BC. This is a thousand years before Jesus would ever be born. And then in the next passage of scripture between verses 7 and 9. He says to him, he says, I will tell you of the decree. <laughs> he says, I'm going to now tell you of the decree, the ordinance that I am going to speak from my mouth of how I will put these nations in derision as I set my king upon my holy hill, Zion, which is another name for the whole city of Jerusalem, a specific mountain in Jerusalem upon the temple mount. So it's talking about God's plan. He says, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. His Messiah is his son. His king is his son. A thousand years before Jesus is ever born, the father, Yahweh, is explaining to us his plan. And he says to his son, I will make the nations your heritage. The nations will be your inheritance. See, we get so caught up in this physical world that we live in and all the problems that we have, right? I mean, come on, let's face reality that we forget. There's an eternity that we are going to enter into. It's not all about eternity because God wants us to be able to live for him today, work with him today, serve him today. But everything that we do in this life, if you don't believe it yet and if you haven't come to the conclusion yet, then I'm glad you showed up today because you needed to be helped out a little bit. It's not all about you and it's not all about what your, your your best life now? No, 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 no. It's all about you and I learning how to submit to his will and allowing him to work in us because what we do today is going to affect our eternity tomorrow. Yes. Amen. The nations are going to be his inheritance. This is his son. This is his plan. And, his, and judgment is coming. And then he goes on in the last verses in verse 12. He says, kiss the son. You know, I don't really have the access. It's too much work to put my pictures up. But one day I'll have all my stuff together and I'll just be able to click on stuff. You know, he didn't say kiss 
the statue of Peter at the Vatican. That's right. To the point where it done wore down the toes on his foot. He said, kiss the sun. Or else, it, or else it's going to result in anger. And, and, and people are going to perish. And, and he's saying to humanity, and he's saying to the people in this church that happen to be here today, kiss the sun, glorify the sun, give honor and glory to the sun, amen, because he is worthy. And the Father has made it so. That's what true Christianity is. That's what true living for God is, is recognizing that God is sovereign and he has his hand in our life and that he has chosen for all the fullness of the Godhead to dwell bodily in his son. And he revealed his, he revealed his heart to us. He revealed his character to us in the sending of his son. Yes. And that's what I want to preach to you this morning about a father and a son. And I want you to know that he wants you to be his sons. Amen. And he wants you to be his children. Yes, he has daughters in a world. Listen, I'm not into the pronoun thing. I'm just trying to make a point. It's, it's, it's specifically a son. You're a son. Yes, you're a child and you're a daughter, but you're a son. You know why? Because it's a family of sons. Because it was created through the son. If it wasn't for the son, there wouldn't be no sons. There would be no children. There would be no family. He planted a sun seed. Hallelujah. He planted a sun seed into this earth. What are you talking about? Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat fall goes into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it would die, it would bear much fruit. Yeah. The sun seed had to go into the ground as a sacrificial offering to die so that now the seed of God could be planted on the inside of your heart and he could grow. Yeah. Come on, man. And when we yield to him and we allow him to do what the word of God says to crucify us. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Amen. Crucify our flesh so that like in the words of John the Baptist I would decrease yeah. So that he might be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the other Wednesday night, now I was saying, because look, this is, um, I don't mean to keep telling the whole story because it gets longer every time I turn around. It gets longer like the train of his robe. It started off, John and I were listening to Luke Pope preach a message about how he had heard that what they did in ancient days is that every time a king would conquer another kingdom, they would take the train of that king's robe and they'd sew it onto their robe. And so now, now every time that this king conquers a kingdom, that robe just gets longer and longer. And he's showing, you see who's really the powerful king here. Amen. And, and then, then it went from that to John talking about, Lord, thank you for conquering my kingdom. Thank you for conquering my kingdom, Lord. And add the train of my robe to your robe, oh Lord, that you would get your glory. And then Naya was sharing with me Wednesday. She was on her way over here. because then we played the song again. They had no, no, no way of knowing that. That she said, as I was hearing that song and the train of his robe fills the temple with glory. She said, I just saw him filling my temple with his robe, with his glory. Amen. And what I'm trying to say is this, is that if you're a believer this morning, and it's so important that you understand this. I believe this and it saddens my heart, but there's churches that are filled with people that are not true converts of Christ. And, and but, but now it's not my job to figure out who's in and who's out. I'm just trying to make a point. If you are a true believer this morning, the seed of Christ has been birthed in your heart. And that means the Holy Spirit has moved in. And when the Holy Spirit moves in, you know you're not the same. Amen. But you also must work and joint participate with the Holy Spirit that he would allow the surgeon's scalpel, the circumcision of the heart to take place in your life so that the train of his robe can fill the temple with glory so that the seed of Christ could grow up in you. And that you and that's a really a big part of my message to tell you is that one of the things that the Lord showed me in the closet was this is that son, the more you get allow me to get rid of you. And the more you allow him to be to grow in you, the more of him I see in you. 
And it really brings me pleasure. <laughs> it really brings me pleasure when I can see my son in you. And I can see my son in my daughter. I can see my son in you and you. And this is how we work and allow the Lord to work with us. Many times we get caught up in gifts, right? Thank God for the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we want you to know you're welcome to move. Thank God for your healing power. Thank God for your prophetic gifts. We thank you, Lord. But there's nothing that shows the glory of God like the fruit of the Spirit being produced on the inside of His children. Come on. Come on. I didn't get a good enough amen. It's not me. It's for the Lord. That the Lord would receive His glory and that Jesus would be would grow up in us amen he'd be manifest in our lives and when people see us out there in the, in the world that they would see jesus yeah. come on yeah. Yeah. thank you lord Hallelujah. in that psalm i saw war i saw restoration i saw rebellion and then and man's obedience need of obedience to the son messiah the king who is the son of god who will restore the will of his father and if we are turning into a people of sons, then we're concerned about restoring the will of our father. And in like the garden on his knees as he sweats blood, he says, not my will be done, but your will be done. What is it that you're fighting with this morning, Christian? What is it that you're in contention with the almighty about regarding your will versus his will? Because we all got something going on in our hearts and in our lives where we're pulling and struggling and tugging and warring with the presence of the Lord. Where we're trying to hold on and we're rebelling against his holiness. We're rebelling against his kingdom. He said he's going to give birth to a son and he's going to give him the nations and, and, and the inheritance of the, as his, the nations as his inheritance. And you know, I put this in, in the notes is that Adam was not faithful. Adam was not faithful and he allowed rebellion in. It's really a big deal. I don't have time to really go backwards. I was sharing it with one of the young people in the church yesterday, though. Whenever I brought, it, I brought us to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 28, I believe it is, where, where he said that in the day that you were created, you were made perfect. You were blameless in the day that you were that you were created. He was talking to he was talking to Lucifer. He was talking to the angel. But he said, because of your beauty, you said within yourself that you were going to elevate yourself. And so therefore I cast you to the ground. You see, this angelic rebellion took place before the world was formed. But in the garden, that same rebel spirit deceived Adam and brought that same rebel spirit into the heart of man. That's right. And born of Adam, every human being now has that rebel spirit in their heart. That's it, that's right. And they're concerned about building their own kingdom. Whether they realize it or not, they're concerned about building their own kingdom more than they're concerned about building the kingdom of God. They're concerned about their own will. That's why Christianity, part of it is a process, my friend. Yeah. Good news is that if you won't quit, he won't quit. Good news is that his love, like he loves you. See, I don't know about you, but it was hard for my daddy to love me. Don't get me wrong. It was a little bit hard for me to love my daddy sometimes. But it had to be hard for my daddy to love me. But praise God, if that man can love me, I know good and well the Father Amen. can love me. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. But I did want to say this, is that, is, is that, you know, because I don't even know how long this little series could go on. And it may not. It may not even go past today. But. I want you to know that we're not, it's not just the rebellion of man. I want you to also understand that there's a lot of help in this because not only did Satan fall, but a third of the angels fell with him. And we don't have time to go to all the various scriptures, but if you've ever read Daniel chapter 10, you would have been introduced to the fact that there's something called a prince of Persia, there's something called a prince of Grecia, and there's Michael, the prince of Israel. So right there, we're already told in the Old Testament book of Daniel that there were three princes that were over countries. And according to Ephesians chapter 6, it says that you're not in war against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against world rulers, and against evil wickedness, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Spiritual wickedness is talking about how the demonic forces are trying to attack you in your personal life, trying to get you to go back to yeah. lust, trying to get you to go back to drugs, trying to get yeah. you to go back to alcohol, trying to ruin your life. But I got 
tell you, God's got his mind on some big stuff, and he's looking for some people that are joining because they got entities that are over nations. Yes, With the confusion of the Tower of Babel, and as the people groups were dispersed, these entities have been ruling over the. I wish I could tell you that they had an angel over America called Christian. I'm not real sure that that be the case. And if, and if it is, then he's over there bandaged up, laying in a corner somewhere because the saints of God in America have shut their mouth and have refused to go to the Lord and to seek his face and to pray and say, Lord, forgive us and to help us to turn from our wicked ways because he promises that if his people called by his name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, that he would restore their land. Listen, at some point in time, it's going to happen, my friend, right? I mean, what is written is going to come to pass. Yes. Yes. The timing, I don't want to get into all that right now. It's, it sure seems to me that we're in the end. Yes. Most people are in agreement with me on that. We're in the end. Does it mean we get a few more good years? I hope so. I'm not looking to see Chinese soldiers running down the other street. I don't want to see that. Or whatever it's going to look like. But at some point in time, it's going to happen. And I feel like the church done fell asleep. We're so consumed and concerned about our own will versus the will of the Father. Lord, help us. So I just wanted you to keep these thoughts in your mind as we uh, move forward. Amen. I will say this, 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, you know, <clears throat> 1 John chapter 1, 2, and 3, well, I tell you, if, if, if the Lord wouldn't have allowed that into the Word, life would have been a little bit easier for Christians. But this is what he says right here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, I'm in the ESV version. By this it is evident yes, who yes. are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Yes, yes. Now, now that probably needs a little bit of explanation, right? Just saying. I mean, I read it. I heard one preacher. Somebody told me one preacher. Some guy came up after the service and he said, Pastor, preacher, I didn't like your interpretation of that scripture. He said, I didn't interpret anything, young man. I just read it. <laughs> I just read it. But it probably needs a, Lord, help me. I'm not trying to get in the way of your word. But I just want to make a point here. If we're honest with one another, we've all, as believers, lived our lives in such a way where we weren't evidently showing righteousness out of our lives, right? So just because you're not... Practicing righteousness at the level does not automatically mean that you're not in Christ or that the seed of the gospel has, but it does mean you're in rebellion. If you're not operating and allowing righteousness to be produced and come out of your life, it does mean that you're not evidently, obviously manifesting the will of God in your life. And it also means that if you don't love your brother, come on somebody, help me out here. Now that's a good word right there because look, we talked about it the other day. We've been preaching a lot on the love because Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples by the love that you have for one yes. another. And, there, and listen, I've had conversations with people in this church, and I've admitted it myself, but sometimes there's been times I just don't like people. Well, you got a problem, son. Because, see, the Word of God says that you're to love your brother. And listen, we're not going to get out, but I, you know, I don't want to get into that. I've already preached it. Go watch one of the other, <laughs> other videos. But that's how we're going to know whether we're the children of God. Because we're talking about sons of God. We're talking about a father. He's a good father. Yes, yes. Amen. If you could go to 1 Peter chapter 2. And let's, let's go ahead and we'll use the King James for this one. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 9 through 11. I just wanted to share this passage of scripture with you. I know Sandy probably already got it queued up. She's probably making me look good. Okay, there you go. He says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who 
called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. I can keep going right there, but what, what about these songs that we sing, right? Whenever we're talking about gratitude, and look, we all got different ways to worship. Not everybody's going to come lay down at the altar. Some people sit, some people stand. That's, it, you know, look, I'm not here to, to try to control how people worship the Lord, but I will tell you this, we're supposed to worship the Lord. Amen. And sometimes the reason we have a hard time worshiping the Lord is the possibility that, we, that we've never really experienced the deliverance from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Because see, when you've experienced that and you're like that old vagabond traveling down that road, right? And then he shows up and he saves you and, and you realize that you weren't the faithful one, but that instead he was the faithful yes. one. And when he comes all up in your heart and he reveals that to you, I don't know about you, but it makes me want to worship him. And it makes me want to start acting a little bit different than what Matt Abraham would normally act. It makes me, I don't like to dance. I'm going to be honest with you, but I have a feeling sooner or later I'm going to start twirling around this place like King David. Because I just tell you, the more I give in to him, the more joy I feel in my heart. And I don't really care what people think about me. I want to have the heart of King David when he told his wife, you think that was bad? It's about to get more undignified in this place because he's worthy. Amen. He's worthy. No, really, if the story is true, he's worthy. Yes. Kiss the sun. Yes. So he says you're a peculiar people. And, you know, whenever we first started this church in one of my first messages, I was trying to explain the word peculiar that I learned from a, from a Greek scholar. Could you go to Isaiah 43, verse 21? The word is actually a preposition in the Greek. I'm not trying to get overly technical, but the word is ice. And whenever I learned a little bit of Greek, the word ice means into. So that's kind of like the idea, into, right? The way it's being used, though, is a make around. Isaiah 43, verse 21 says this, says this. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. He said, you are a peculiar people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. Peculiar is kind of outdated. It doesn't mean you're weird. It means you've been formed by God specifically for him. He created you. He surrounded you. And the idea is ownership. If you truly belong to the Lord this morning, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price through the precious blood of a lamb. His son his precious son that he sent upon this earth to die for you, amen, to set you free and to put you back into relationship with him. So he says this right here. He says, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you would show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people. And there's a whole lot we could break down on that, but there was a time in your life that you didn't know the first thing about the Lord. Yes. Right. But now you are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. And then he goes on to say this, dearly beloved, I beseech you. He said, I'm begging you to do this as though you were a stranger and a pilgrim on this earth. Abstain from fleshly lusts. They war against your soul. See, just as the enemy in ancient times before the human race was ever created said, I will lift myself up above the throne of God and he allowed rebellion to enter in and then he enters into the garden and he, in, he causes that spirit of rebellion to enter the heart of man. He's still working on you now as a believer that has the seed of the Christ birth in you to try to get you to not abstain from fleshly lust, but instead to have a fleshly lust party. I was sharing with one person this morning, we were talking about even, and I talk about this kind of stuff a lot, not because I'm trying to make anybody mad, but because I'm just trying to tell you the truth. That even the music industry, People get tired of me talking about this, but you just go ahead and do me a favor. If you're a child of God, if you listen to secular music, do me a favor. The next time you're listening to secular music, I want you to see the message that they're speaking to you. I want you to pay attention to the message that they're speaking to you. Because we oftentimes think of lust as, oh, I'm going to be in another relationship or I need a man to make me happy or I need a woman to make me happy or I need... Then, you know, I want to, you know, no, no, no. 
sometimes it's like us just opening up our heart and allowing the world to speak to us. And the next thing you know, we'll be we'll be rolling right with them. I had another person that I talked to this morning. I was like, brother, the Lord told me to get rid of all that stuff. He said, I threw it away. And praise God, I started noticing that the music I was listening to made me want to go back. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Yes, yes. Are we so blind and ignorant that we don't realize that there are spirits connected right. to that stuff, that the God of this world is caught. And what is the God of this world trying? The whole music industry is filled with rebellion. And listen, I, I, I don't get weird too much like this too often, but I can remember being in detention home at 15 years old. And they were playing this music in the thing, Quiet Riot. You probably don't remember it. Bang your head! And I was over there like just so frustrated because I was thinking about the spirit of rebellion. Listen to me. I, look, the, the enemy came in and caused the rebellion to enter into the heart of man. And the word of God says to respect the authorities that he has given in place. And, and you know, we'll rebel against our, our dad. We'll rebel against the police department. We'll rebel against the principal. I didn't re I re I, everywhere I went, I rebelled. I, I rebelled against, no, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do, Dad. Not after what you did. Okay. And then you, then you end up in school and it's like, I'm not going to do what you say, Mr. Principal. And, you know, you get spankings back in the day and all this other stuff happening. And then the next thing you know, I'm in a field one time when I shouldn't have been there doing stuff. And it's like I rebelled against the cop, the policeman. I told I gave him an earful. And the next thing you know, like five billy clubs are hitting me in the head. And then I'm in detention home, and I'm, I'm rebelling against the warden of the detention home. And then now I'm stuck in this solitary place, and there's bang your head. And, and it's like my, my mind and my heart is filled with rebellion, and I can't even do anything about it. I can't unleash it because I'm stuck in this spot. Listen to me, man. Don't play games with the spirit of rebellion. You're like, well, I'm not in a detention home listening to quiet, right? Yeah, but are you rebelling against the authority that God has placed in his word? You study the word to find out what he's done with authority and what he says is authority. And you decide what you're going to do with that and what that means for you. He owns you, though. I want you to know that. He bought you. You're his personal, you're his own people that he created. And the purpose that he created you for was that you would show forth the praise of him. Yes. Yes. Who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Amen. I, wanted, I really wanted to talk to you this morning about God's family. <coughs> this is a very special family. It's a special kind of people. It, it's a family of sons. Amen. It's sons because the family is created in and through the son. It's a family of sons that are kings and priests because... They rule with him and for him, and that's what kings do. They rule and reign, right? They may, they're, they're, they're also not just kings ruling and reigning, because a lot of people like that. I mean, I'm going to declare some stuff. I'm going to walk in some authority. But they're also priests, and they intercede for God to mankind. Amen. See, it's not just the pastor that's called to be a king and a priest. It's every believer that has truly given their heart to the Lord is called to be a king and a priest. And like, well, I don't really want to do that. I just want to show up on set. Well, then you, then, then that's fine. You're welcome to come, to come. And I mean, you're welcome to find a church that, you know, whatever the case, but, but that's not God's will. God's will. See, whenever the word of God says in Revelation chapter five, then he said, you have made us kings and priests unto our God from every tongue, tribe, and nation. You redeemed us with your precious blood. He, that's what he's come to do to make it. And he wants us to partner with him. He wants us to intercede for others. He wants us to, to be the role of a priest with others as we be go-betweens between a lost and dying world and people that are hurting and that we share Jesus with them and that we also operate in authority upon this earth. So he says, and the more that they die, right? I talked about this already. The more his image of his son is birth in us. And I want you to know that Satan's plan is to rob man from his opportunity to be a son. And to rob from God his opportunities to have sons through his son. 
And a non-rebellious son is the desire to please a father. I thought this was, this was important to me when I was writing it. And a non-rebellious son is the desire to please his father. You know, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, y'all y'all understand the, the importance of that relationship between a, 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 let's talk about a good son. You know, I mean, have you ever known a son that was ple trying to be pleasing to his father? I'm talking about in the physical. I know we know Jesus, amen. And, 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 and a good father wants to be with his son, right? And during that time, he'll teach his son the important things of life. I've heard stories of men who said that their fathers would teach them things. I heard one story recently, a guy said, I said, how did you learn how to be a, a mechanic? He's like, man, my dad told me and my brother, tear those engines down, put them back together, and when I come back, they better run, and there better not be any extra parts. And then I've heard people talk about their, their father saying, we're gonna learn how to work on these, these, you know, do this mechanic work, but look, son, let me show you how to do this. And he's right there, he's right there with them, amen? And I, I was thinking about the fact that uh, also this is a concept of fathers. I was just talking to somebody the other day, day and it kind of intrigued me about a family-owned company. Y'all remember, I couldn't think of a name of one, but y'all remember that old show of Sanford and Son, right? And sometimes you'll see the names of these companies and it's like such and such and Son, right? And that's the name of the company. And so what they're really trying to do is they're trying to pass the business off to their son. They're trying to, through the years, they're going to explain to their son, hey, son, this is what we do. This is our business. And I want to train you in the way so that you can take over one day and that, that, you can, that you can, you know, run the business. And through the generations, the father would teach the son the business. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I say it like that because that's how my dad, y'all say, what you doing, dad? I'm, I'm taking care of my business, boy. It wasn't that he didn't know how to spell business. It wasn't that he didn't know how to say the word right, but it just had added. It was important. I'm taking care of my business, boy. I want you to know that the father wants you and I to be about our father's business. Amen. Jesus said in Luke 2, 49, they didn't lost him. He was a teenager. He said, we're, we've come all the way back. We were on our way back to Galilee and we lost you. He said, did you not know that I was to be about my father's business? Jesus said, it is my meat, my very food to do my father's will. Yes, yes. He wants a family of sons that will submit to his will, allowing their own personal flesh and desires to be crucified so that his spirit and will can be produced in them. Thank you, Lord. You know, I'm realizing that the more I listen to the words of my father, the more I hear that the fallen fleshly part of me must be done away with yes. so that Jesus can be formed in me. Yes. Amen. And in order for this to happen, it means that I must be crucified with his son. Yes, yes. So that a new creature can be resurrected in his son. And the more that I submit to the will of the Father, the more my original man that was born of my earthly man, Adam, dies, and the more that the heavenly man born in Jesus is formed. And when this happens, the Father starts to see a reflection, I've already said it, but it can't say it enough, of his beloved Son in whom he is well pleased. Instead of a reflection of a rebellious Son that was born in the image of his earthly father, Adam. It says in Romans 8 and 29, we're about to actually go to the book of Romans here in a moment. You can go ahead and go there to verse 1. I feel like this is what the Lord told me to do. I don't typically do it this way, but I want to be obedient to him. But in Romans 8, 29, it says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You know, I guarantee we're going to have some good conversation right here about predestination and election and the choosing out. But what I will tell you is this, is that whatever side of the fence somebody stands on, I promise you that it is God's foreknowledge and will and his predestination that those that are going to be in Christ, amen, end up being formed in fashion to look like Christ. Yes, yes. I know that much. I know that that is the will of the Father that you and I would be formed and fashioned into the image of of his son. Yes, that Jesus would be the firstborn among many brethren. 
I don't want to get into this, but I had a long conversation with a Jehovah Witness at one of the clinics, and he was an elder. And, and listen, he was like, well, I've never met somebody like this before. And I was like, well, that doesn't mean that the, that the church is wrong just because Christians don't most of the time don't know what they're talking about. And, and I'm here to tell you that, that the word firstborn doesn't mean what you think it means because you think it means that he was created. But he wasn't created because he was the eternal son that became flesh. Yeah. He was born. The first man, Adam, was created and fell into sin. And you and I were born in the image of our father, Adam, because of sin. But Jesus was born into the world, but he was already in existence. He was actually the eternal word that spoke the world into existence. But then he clothed himself in flesh. For a purpose to fulfill the Father's will. And he was the firstborn from the dead. He died in the physical flesh so that he could be resurrected and he received his glorified body. And that now when you and I get born again in him, he starts the process of changing us. He starts the process of changing us. Making us look more like him. And this is the beauty of the truth of God's word is this, is that one day when we see him, we're going to be like him. Hallelujah. We're going to receive our glorified body. Amen. And he was the firstborn. And he's in the process of changing. Sorry, right, let's get into Let's get into Romans. The Lord wants to, and I don't know that we're going to get past, much past this, but I'm talking to you about sons this morning. And I want you to know before we get into the text that the father loves you. Amen. And he's proven his love because he sent his son, amen, to die for us. And I know you know that this morning, but I want you to know how much he does love you. And that his love towards you, though, is, is that you would, we would learn to obey his will. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let me just say this, too. It's very important that you understand this. And we're not going to get into all the depth of the theology behind it right now. But it's important that you understand that you can't just do it yourself. You can't just walk out of this place today and say, well, I think I'm going to look like Jesus. No. you got to understand that Jesus not only purchased salvation for you so that you can have eternal life, but he also broke the power of sin. He broke the power of the forces of darkness when he went to the cross. That's what it says in Colossians 2, 14 and 15. And if you will believe God according to his will, then what you will learn is that God can work in you, amen, and he can change you, and he can give victory to you, amen. Yes, yes. Let's take a look at, at, uh, at chapter 8, verse 1. He says, Therefore there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You know, when I started to count some words here, I noticed the word sons was used 10 times, the word spirit was used 16 times, and the word flesh was used eight times. He says there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ who don't walk after the flesh but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now I want you to understand something. This is some deep stuff. But just bear with me. We're only going to verse 17. It, it, number one, I want you to understand that these two laws, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death are not the same thing as the law of Moses. These are spiritual laws and the law of sin and death came into existence whenever Adam disobeyed the father's will. Whenever the father told Adam, you shall not eat from this tree, and Adam ate from the tree, the disobedience of Adam caused a shift to take place in the spiritual realm, and a law came into existence, and the law is the spirit, is the law of sin and death. And that born of Adam, we've all been born with this law hanging over our lives, hanging over our heads. But I got good news for you because there's a spirit of life in Christ Jesus and that that spirit of life can set you free or has set you free from the law of sin and death. The, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is more powerful than the law of sin and death. What Jesus did for you on the cross and when he died to break the power of sin is more powerful than the power of sin in your life. 
You can't, you can't fast it away. You can't read it away. You can't go to church enough in a way. You can't pray enough away. You can't do nothing enough to make the power of sin not have dominion over you. But you can rest. Come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You will find rest for your weary soul. Rest in him. Trust in him. Believe in his finished work. You want an object of faith? Put your faith in that Jesus did it. His, did what he did was enough. Yes, yeah. yes. And watch it move in your life. But it got tried that last year, preacher, and it didn't work. Fight the good fight of faith. Don't give up. Don't quit believing. Keep on trusting. I wish I really had time to preach this because I'm going to tell you, we got a default position. And it's just like Adam clothed himself with fig leaves and Cain brought vegetables. We have a default position to go back trying to do it in our own strength. That's right. Trying to do it through formulas, trying to do it through programs, yeah. trying to do it any other way. I'm here to tell you, no, sir, no, ma'am, it's not going to work because, yeah, you might stay good for a little period of time. But I'm talking about what the Lord wants to do is to reach in oh, and to do something oh, in here. Yeah. Yeah. He says, for what the law could not do. Now we're talking about the Mosaic law. See, because the law is not bad. Paul said that in Romans chapter 7. He said, the law is not the problem. I'm the problem. Yes, yes, yes. I'm carnal, sold under sin. Yes. We, we've been blaming the law. I've even blamed the law. No, it's not the law's fault, but you can't live according to the law. But look what he said. The law could not do it. Why? Because it was weak. Why was the law weak? Because of our flesh. Because of our sinful flesh. He, but God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He didn't have sinful flesh. God sent his son in the likeness of man's flesh. Man's flesh is sinful. God sent his son. His son had to become flesh. His son had to become human. We'll get into that in a moment. Why? Because in the because and for sin he condemns sin in the flesh because you see you got to understand something God created Adam in his own image and likeness and when he created him he had no sin in him God said it is good but then Adam brought sin into him and now flesh is tainted the human flesh is tainted praise God and so therefore I was saying that I think young man yesterday but I say it to people all the time wherever I'm in you can't die for your sin you can't die for your own sin because you were born a sinner. That's, right. That's why God, but see, God created Adam without sin. Oh, this is the Bible. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> God created Adam without sin. Amen. And, 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 what I, and, and so then man sinned. And so now it requires a sinless sacrifice. Yes. But the blood of bulls and goats cannot remove sin. So God sent himself. In the likeness of sinful flesh, because the wages of sin is death. And so therefore he had to die to pay the penalty of sin so that you and I could have access to his life. Amen. Praise God. And so our old man dies in Christ and a new man is resurrected in Christ. Thank God for resurrection power. The same spirit that raised him from the dead will also quicken your mortal body. Praise God. So in verse 4, he says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So Jesus has already fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law because he kept the law. None of us can keep the law. And then he died and he became a curse according to the law. And he took the curse of the law upon him for yes. us. But I've got good news for you this morning, my friend. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you can keep the law to its perfection, but we're not over here trying to live according to the law because the Word of God says that if any man's going to live according to the law, he must do them, and he must do every last part of it. But I will tell you this. You can live a life where you do not commit adultery yes. based upon the power of God. Yes. Come on, help me out. You can live a life where you honor your mother and your father because of the grace that flows from the Holy Spirit because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. If you will not live according to the flesh, but instead according to the spirit. But you let your flesh have its way and you see how far you can go. 
He says, for they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh. But they after, that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Right. See, the things of the spirit, part of the things of the spirit are what I read to you in Psalm chapter 2. Mm. Because see, the spirit is saying, what is the father's will? Mm. What is the father's heart? Yes. What is the Father's heart for you yes. in your personal yes. life? What is, your, what is the Father's heart for this earth? Amen. What is the Father's heart for what he's That's doing? Good. Will you seek, will you truly seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness? He says in verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been times, even as a pastor, I hope you, I hope you don't, like think less of me. I'm just. I want to be a transparent guy. There's been times, even as a pastor, that as I've been in the flesh, I lost peace. And if I'm not careful, it'll happen this afternoon after I go eat with my family. To where sometimes something happens, something is said, something I don't like, something, whatever the case, and I and I try. You know what? I, one of the things I learned about too about flesh. I thought this, I learned it. The Lord showed me this a long time ago. All right, y'all ready for this? Flesh. If we make another word out of this, human, <laughs> and then we spell this backwards, self. Flesh is all about self. Yeah. Yes, yes. Human flesh is all about self. And one of the things that I've learned is that when somebody says something that I don't like, and I then then a lot of times what I'm trying to do is protect my own self. That's right. That's when right. I feel that thing come up on the inside of me and I respond in a way that's not appropriate, it's like I don't like the way you just talk to me. Well, guess what? I don't like the way they talk to Jesus either, but he just like a lamb led to the slaughter, did not even yeah. open up his mouth. Yeah. We talk about how God's our defender, but we half the time don't even really believe it because we're always taking our own defense. Yes. Come on. Right? Come on, somebody help me. Self. Self needs to be moved out of the way. Yes, Lord. Because look what it said. But see, when self is moved out of the way, there's life and peace. Life and peace. The word of God says he brings a peace that surpasses yes. understanding. Yes. It doesn't make any sense. You can still be in the same situation. I was in the jail two weeks ago, and this guy kind of stopped, and he's like, man, I, I'm, I've got all this stuff going on in my head. i got to get a divorce when I get out of here. And, and you know, we, we ended up talking. It was a long, long story. But the point is, is that he had no peace. And at one point in time, I'm like, so you don't you believe that the Lord's arm's too short? <laughs> like you got a little short arm. Mine can't reach out there and do what needs to be done. So you just already got it determined in your head that you have gotta get a divorce. <laughs> when the reality of it is is that his arm's not short. That's right. His That's arm's right. long. That's right. And he can reach over there to Mambu or Kington or wherever it is that woman is, and you'll trust him, and, and he can do a miracle. That's right. Amen. Yeah. And he can shift it. And he can change it. But if you're going to sit here in this cell all day long, day after day, thinking about and letting bitterness enter into your heart and cause frustration. Come on, somebody. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. And you're just sitting here stewing in your bitterness yeah. and your anger. You need to learn that that's not the Holy Spirit. Amen. See, the Lord wants to bring peace. And whenever you learn to rest, and when you learn to, to take his yoke upon you, mm. and to find rest for your weary soul, the next thing you know, he brings that peace that surpasses understanding. And the reason I got into that is because your situation might not be different. That's right. Now, and that's another question. How much will we really have a desire to obey his word? That's right. I didn't tell you it was going to be easy. Because... You know one of the things, this none of this is in the notes, but you know one of the things that we have a problem with with, the work, with with walking with God is because half the time we don't see how much he needs to do in us. Yes. We are always looking at everybody else. Lord, this woman you gave me, if you just change her, if you just change her, trust me, she doesn't say the same about Pastor Matt. 
but, but what I'm trying to say is, well, hold on a second. He might be trying to change you. And if you'd recognize that and yield to his will, you might be surprised how fast he does a turnaround. Late in the midnight hour, God's going to turn it around and around. Hallelujah. Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail. Praise God. They began to praise the Lord. And what happened? The earth began to quake. The door opened up. The shackles and the chains were broken. People started getting saved. But we over here letting the devil beat us up. Let us not let the devil beat us up. Come on. Amen, church. He's life in peace. Because, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity or hostility against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's right. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Yes, now, that's yes. very powerful. That's let's, right. just, let's not go too fast. Yeah. Let's look at that. If any man has not the spirit of the Christ, if you look at it in the Greek, I can promise you it has the definite article. It would say the Christ. He is none of his. If the spirit of Jesus, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is not in you, yes. then you don't belong to him. Now, it's not my job to decide whether he's in you or not. It's not your neighbor's job to decide whether he's in you. Don't be elbowing your neighbor. But I do want you to know when people can be mad at me when I say this, I am concerned when I look at the condition of the church overall because I'm going to tell you right now the spirit of the Christ overall in this American church that we're looking at is not really having its way. That's right. Right? And because when the spirit of Jesus is in you, he starts changing you. Yeah. And, he, and he starts pleading with you. Yes. And he starts talking to you about humbling yourself and lowering yourself under the will of God. Yes. Amen? Yes. So I want to tell you, though, and you know how you know? How you know uh, go to Ephesians 1.13 for me. This wasn't in my notes, but I want you to see something real quick. We still got a little time. I'm being mindful of you. In whom, who do you think that pronoun's about? In whom? It's talking about Jesus. Jesus. In whom you trusted after you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. See, that's how you know whether you really got saved or not. I mean, that's between you and the Lord. I'm just trying to give you a clue. Because just because listen, people like, oh, you believe in your heart, you pray with your mouth. You know what? That salvation prayer, dude, I'm not against it, but I'm telling you right now, that's a dangerous thing. Whenever you're like, oh, you just gotta raise your hand and pray a little prayer. No, you better pray it from your heart, believe it from your heart, and confess it with your mouth that when you do, you're gonna get filled with the Holy Spirit. That means the Spirit. Christ is going to move into your heart and you ain't going to be the same. And now if you want to start looking more like Jesus, you're going to have to listen to the Spirit and cooperate with the Spirit as He speaks to you. Yeah. So is the Spirit of the Christ living in you? Come on. Yeah. I don't know if it comes across. I don't know how it comes across. I asked Michael one time. I'm like, says, how's it? What's it like sitting out there listening? <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know I love people. I want you to know I love Jesus. And, and, and the reason that I do it is not, yeah, if I'm angry at anybody, I'm mad at the devil. Okay? But I'm not mad at human beings. I, I'm, mad, I'm mad at what the devil's doing to people. And, and, and I, just, I just want you to know that the love of God, because see, as, and I know I keep saying this, and I don't mean to be redundant. It's not like I have amnesia or that I've got dementia or nothing like that. I remember clearly. I probably said it about ten times in the last month. The Lord keeps reminding me, and I think it's because I, He wants me to make sure you get it. He, he told me right here, "You don't get it, son. Neither you nor my people get it that there's coming a day when they're going to cross the spiritual Jordan, and when that happens." There is no more talk. And you need to remind them that I've been trying to reason with people for thousands of years. 
I said it in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Come and let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they can be made white like wool. Yes. But the man says, I have time. No, today is the day of salvation. Amen. You're in the valley of decision. Amen. And to yield to him, today is the day to yield. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Today is the day to yield to the Lord. Because you belong to him. And he loves you. Listen, I'm not talking about losing your salvation. You're either in or you're out. I'm talking about, I keep saying it, but it ain't going to be like, what's up, Lord? Give me a little what? You died for me? Oh, yeah. It ain't going to be like that. I heard a preacher talk about it the other day. John the Beloved that laid his head on the breast of the Lord when he said, I saw him. I felt his door. I were dead in his feet. Yes. It's not going to be knuckle bump. He's holy. Yes. He's holy. He's holy. He's a thrice holy God. If you ain't come clothed in his garment of righteousness, you, <laughs> you'd be consumed, dissipated. That's right. I just need you to know he's holy. And at the same time, he's love. But he's not a love that people are trying to convince us, a love that's okay with sin. That's right. If he was okay with sin, do you think he would have brutally ravaged his son the way he did? You think he would have ripped the skin off of his back? I was listening to a preacher talk the other day. The worst part was after the cross. If you saw a man carrying a cross, he ain't coming back. And the worst part was after he died, then the, then the vultures are coming and they're like getting some, yeah, and then the dogs are coming and they're licking the, there ain't nobody watching the crucifixion after they lose their breath. Ain't nobody wanting to see all that grotesque stuff. You think that God the Father would have allowed that to happen to a son if he was okay, ready to wink at sin? The Apostle Paul said in times past he might have been winking, but he ain't winking no more. He's demanding that people repent. Yes, yes. And you can't be a true convert if you have not repented. Yes, yes. It means you got to change your mind, my friend. Yes, yes. And listen to me. The more he reveals, the more we'll repent. Right? Because yes. see, where you thought you was good today, next year you... But if you're walking with the Lord, you'd be like, I went right last year. Yeah. Lord, forgive me. I changed my mind by your grace to line up with what your word says. Yes. And the more we repent, the closer we get. And I heard Brother Wilkerson say, or somebody told me, he said recently, he said, I realize that the closer I get to the Lord <laughs> and the more I walk in the light, the more I can see that's not right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Because the light shines Right, they yeah. See, we either really want to serve him or we don't, or we're just, or we're going to punch a God clock. Mm. Do our little time, right? That's right. I did it. All my, all my buddies, all my friends, we all, no, no, he's worthy. Amen. He's going to get his glory and his honor. The angels, you know, I'm not, none of this is in my message, but I'm just keep saying, the angels, are, they know the story. They look from heaven. They peer over. That's what the word says. They look into this thing called salvation. It's like they're on the precipice of heaven. And they're looking through the portals of glory. And they're like, hey, I lost another one. I am free. I am free. And then the angels are singing is what it says whenever another sinner repents and comes to the Lord. Because they know they don't understand this. What is this thing called salvation? All we know is that our brothers rebelled against God and they were cast out of heaven. But look what he does with his mercy and his grace upon this inferior creation that he made that they keep they keep cheating on him they keep going against him but look what he does he pours out his grace he, he loves him so much what a wow what a beautiful thing and then if, if they i don't know how long they live but i'm sure it's not very long they probably turn right back around to the land you are holy you are worthy yes. yes. you purchased with your blood from every tongue tribe and nation you are holy. You are worthy. 
Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the King. He's worthy to be exalted. He's worthy to be worshipped. Man, you're a little bit too far out there preaching. No, I'm not far enough. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Jesus. I don't know what they're talking about in other churches this morning. All I know is that Jesus is worthy. He's worthy to receive his glory and his honor. Lord, help your pastors. Help your evangelists. Help your preachers and your teachers to tell everyone he's worthy. And if people don't like it and they don't like the real Jesus, hey, he's worthy. He's worthy to receive his glory and his honor. Oh, let us be a church that gives you glory and honor, Lord. Yes. That's all I ask, Lord. That's all I ask. And won't you visit us with your presence and won't you do something in our heart and won't you make us fall in love with Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. And if Christ be in you, verse 10, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life. Because of righteousness. So your body might be dying, but the spirit's alive. Yeah. Now look at this. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead, he's also going to bring life to your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Don't give up, Christian. Amen. Amen. Don't give up. Keep trusting the Lord. Keep seeking after him. Keep going after him. Because his spirit's going to raise you up. You might have, the devil thought he had you down. He thought he got a liver shot on you. But no, he don't get to win in the end. The Lord, you're either in or you're out. If the spirit of Christ is in you, the devil don't get no liver shot. Praise God, you're going to rise up. Same spirit that raised him up is going to rise you up. Yes, yes. Amen. And you just let him work in you. That's the truth of the word right there. Thank you, Lord. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. You got an obligation, but it's not to live according to the flesh. Yes. And if you live after the flesh, you are going to die. But if you through the spirit would put to death. I love that word, mortify right there. What would, yeah, there you go, mortify. I like that. I keep saying people that have been in the church for a long time, and I'm tired of hearing the work of a mortician. <laughs> Putting to death, dealing with dead things. The spirit puts to death the old man. The spirit puts to death the flesh. Amen. And the spirit of God causes resurrection life to come. Yes, yeah. Amen. There's two sides to the cross. Don't ever tell me that we got to move past the cross. They got preachers that said that back in the 50s. That's a lie from the devil. That's right. Can't ever leave the cross. There's two sides to the cross, by the way. There's a death side of the cross. There's a resurrection side yes, of the cross. Yes. And you can't have a true resurrection if you hadn't had a true crucifixion. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Verse 12. Therefore, uh, I'm sorry. We're, we're in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, this is the really where I wanted to get to right here. Hallelujah. They are the sons of God. Yes, yes. <laughs> Lord, lead us by your Spirit. One of the first things to understand about being led by the Spirit is to understand that now that you put faith in Christ, if you're a true believer, according in the mind of God, your old man that was born of Adam has truly died. That's Romans chapter 6, that's Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but he liveth in me. And now this life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the word of God. It went, the day you got saved in the mind of the father, your old man born of Adam died. Yes. It's important that you understand that so that you can know what to believe according to God. <laughs> I used to say this all the time. I don't want to get anybody upset with me. I was never in a Christian rehab. I've been better off at it. I went to one of them. But by 19, I was, I was in three rehabs <laughs> by the age of 19. But you know one of the things the Lord showed me when he first started getting really after 12 years of Christianity he started to show me he said he, he, he said he said I'm not I don't do rehab son I mean, in other words God doesn't rehabilitate he recreates yes. 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 you understand what I'm saying yes. and so so as long as I'm learning that he's that I'm a, a new creation in Christ Jesus old things have passed away all things have become new Look, look, I told people this story before, but whenever I first became a nurse, right, I went to, I was a high school dropout. I'd been arrested for felonies, never convicted of a felony. And whenever I went to apply for nursing school, they said, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Nope. 
Okay, go all the way through nursing school, right? Graduate with honors, praise God. It was all his glory, amen. And then now the, the question for the NCLEX, which is the nursing board, says, have you ever been arrested for, uh, convicted of, or accused of anything more than a minor traffic violation? Oh, my head's about to explode because I have no choice but to say, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Threw me into a whole new algorithm, my friend. Got to go talk to an addictionologist now, sitting down there, and he's like, hey, listen, man, I'm not proud of my life, but I'm going to tell you, you you did what, sir? You robbed houses? Yeah, I hung around with some pretty rough characters. Yeah, I'm blaming it on them, right? He's like, he's like, no, 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 if you did that, that means you're an addict, and once an addict, always an addict. And then he said this, and then, and, then, and then the next thing you know, they're like, okay, this is the thing. If you want to be a nurse, then you got you to gotta submit Oh, yeah, we started off here. I didn't plan on this. You got to submit to authority. After you done did four and a half years of college and graduated and ain't been in trouble in 10 years, oh, no, sir, you're going to submit to the authority of the Board of Nursing of the state of Louisiana. And you're going to call your color every morning, whether it's bronze or plum. <laughs> And if it's your color, you're going to walk your little self across the street. And you're going to go ahead and give us a specimen, number one. And number two, you're going to go to not two, but three AA meetings a week. And you're going to do this for two years. And, and, and you go into the AA meeting and you're like, they, they, they're teaching you about a higher power, right? And, and you're like, okay, well, I, I can do this. Jesus is my higher power. And that was cool the first time. They were like, yeah, man, hoorah, Jesus. And then I'm like, but Jesus is my higher. And I'm trying to tell them, no, you need a different higher power. And I know I got myself in trouble. They're like, well, we're good, good, glad you found Jesus. But if he wants this table to be his high power, that table, what are you talking about? It's an inanimate object. How's a table going to help somebody? You put your faith in a table? That's just, oh, now they create God in their own image after their own likeness. They're creating statues out of an inanimate objects. Oh, Lord, help. I don't even know what my point was. <laughs> Other than that, I was a mess. I don't know you changed it. Why did I get into all of that? New creation. New creation. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I started off just really wanting to tell a part about the addictionologist because you're. I didn't say it. And I wouldn't have gotten my nursing license had I said it, but I wish I could beat him now. Sir, you're, no, it's not true. What you're telling me isn't true. I don't know that I want to call him a liar to his face because I really want to help people. But, but what he said was a lie. Come on. That's where I got started because God ain't doing rehab. He's doing recreation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's doing regenerate. He regenes people. I'm not talking about CRISPR. I'm talking about you're being regened by the, by the Lord that put himself on the inside of you. And the question is, can we believe it? And can we hold on to it? And will somebody teach it to us? Will somebody teach it to us? The Apostle Paul said, did you not know? Were you ignorant? Nobody took the time to tell you that those of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried with him. Hallelujah. We've been baptized in the newness of life. Amen. If he was raised from the dead, we too should walk in newness of yes. life. Hallelujah. That's the truth. Hallelujah. That's the truth. You're a new creation. Amen. Don't let nobody tell you nothing different. That's right. That's right. Come on. Come on. Let the Lord speak to you. Amen. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. He said, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Verse 15, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You see Adam and Eve over there hiding in them trees like that, shaking. Spirit of fear, they done became slaves to sin. And they're under bondage of sin. He said, you have not received the spirit of fear again, but you, instead you have received the spirit of adoption, where, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, my Father, thank you, my Father, for revealing yourself to me, for making me a son, even though I wasn't deserving, even though I wasn't worthy of you, you came and you rescued me. Time and again, time and again. Oh, because you're a good father. Yes. And look at this, the spirit. This is another evidence like what I was trying to tell you earlier in yes. Ephesians 1.13. 
Verse 16, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Do you like the things of God? Yes, yes. yes. No, I mean, I ask that to everybody, young people, old people. Do you like the things of God? Because if you don't really like the things of God, you need to question whether the Spirit of God is in you. And if the Spirit of God's not in you, then are you really born again? Yes, yes. Or is there a spirit of a rebel? Lord help us. Verse 16, verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, yes. that we may be also glorified together. Amen. Amen. If we're children and we're heirs, we're joint heirs with Christ. Listen, this is just the beginning because I'm going to tell you right now, a lot more is written in this book about what God's going to do through his son to these nations. And he said in Psalm chapter two, he said, I'm going to give you the nations as your inheritance. And the scripture right here says that we're heirs with him. We're co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Amen. I'm about to close. Singers, musicians, y'all can come up. But before they do, I'm going to ask them to put Hebrews 2, maybe you can keep it in the King James. Hebrews 2, verse 11, as they make their way up here. I just want you to know that it's not okay for there to be rebellion allowed in the house. The enemy allowed, he brought rebellion against God's kingdom, against God's rule. He brought it into humanity. But God has a plan. Amen. It says it in verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 2. It says, For both he that sanctifies and they that are sanctified are all of one. That's talking about Jesus because he is the one that sanctifies and he sanctifies us. Amen. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. I meant to say it earlier. Part of this message had to do with God uses family talk. Father, son, children, Brothers, amen, bridegroom, bride, offspring, because see, God desires to create an eternal family. God's plan is to have an eternal yes. family, yes. amen, and he says right here that he was not ashamed to call them brethren, and he said this, this is a prophecy about Jesus, I will declare your name to my brethren. I've been praying lately, and I'm like, thank you. He sent my brother for me. And I was thinking about the prodigal son, too. Remember the story? I talked about it a while back. And how that brother was sitting over there like this. And I was thinking how different Jesus is. Jesus, listen. I see Jesus as that prodigal. Jesus, I mean, as the brother. Jesus done ran and found that man. Right? He's over there about to eat them pig pods. And Jesus whispers in his ear. Yes, yes, yes. You had an orgy. You don't have to eat that pig pot. You don't have to go one step further. He's waiting for you. I know it because he talks about it all the time. He misses your presence. Let's go back together. Let's go back together. See, that's the real brother right there. That's Jesus. That's how we're supposed to do one another. Come on, let's go back. Amen. And he said, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the church, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God has given me. Look at verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Our brother had to become he had to take upon himself flesh and blood so that he could die for us, so that he could restore us, so that he could be the sacrifice. One thing that I got to tell you as we close this morning is this, is that he's worthy. He's worthy of your honor. If you need prayer this morning, the altars are always open. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, I'd love to pray with you. 
Amen. But listen, give it, let's give them just a little bit of time this morning. We got two young people, Jace and Aiden, are going to be getting baptized after church, so if you can hang around. Amen. Thank you, Jace.